Hi, I'm Carolyn Levitt. I'm the co-founder of A Mighty Blaze, the book initiative that began when the pandemic did, because none of us at A Mighty Blaze thought that bookstore doors should be shuttered and that readers should not have access to writers and vice versa. We're now going on our fourth year, which means A Mighty Blaze is a toddler. So I'm really excited today because we're doing something different than just than merely talking to an author. We're going to be talking about a topic, which is books to film with the most wonderful Elizabeth Searle, which is something that every writer wants to know about. So let me tell you a little bit about Elizabeth first, and then we're gonna just jump into the conversation. Oh, and also I've put up for all of you listening, I've put up links where you can buy all of Elizabeth's books as well you should. There are links to bookshop.org, which will lead you to your nearest indie bookstore. If if you have any questions, just please put them in the chat and we will get to them. Okay, so Elizabeth is the author of five books of fiction. We Got Him, Girl Held in Home, Celebrities in Disgrace, the best title I've ever heard of, um, <laughs> A Four-Sided Bed, My Body to You. A Four-Sided Bed appeared on the Boston Globe paperback bestseller list. It was an editor's choice on Amazon and was nominated for an ALL, ALA Book Award. Her Celebrities in Disgrace was called a miniature masterpiece in the New York Times Book Review and was produced as a short film in 2010. Create Tricks Films is now developing a four-sided bed as a feature film. Okay, so the reason why I was so excited to talk to Elizabeth, besides loving her novels, is because she's also wildly successful uh, writing scripts. And that's something that's really, really hard to do because usually, well, at least I've always been told, my scripts read like novels. Um, and often screenwriters in my novel writing class their novels some like scripts. So we're going to talk about all this stuff. So first, welcome, Elizabeth, to our edition of Books to Film. Um, welcome being here. Also, thank you, Robin, for saying hello in the comments. It's always nice to see a comment. So let's thank talk about... You are so welcome. So let's talk about your newest work first. So... Four Sided Bed is an, was an amazing wasn't is an amazing novel, and it's screening now at various festivals across the country. Um, it's that's got a short. Like, yeah, yeah, that's a it's, short. Got, it's a short. It's got amazing reviews. The Seattle Times wrote, "It's lyrical. It's got sadness and longing and the necessity of reinvent, reinvention." I wanted to know what is it like. Uh, what's the whole process of you've written something that was in book form and it feels like, okay, this is the form it should take. How do you morph it into a script? That's the question, Caroline, and you put it so well. Often the script reads like a novel or, read, or the novel yeah. reads like a script and it's hard. You know, something that has really helped me, Caroline, is in addition to trying to, we are in the process of, you know, developing a four-sided bed as a feature film. And I also am a co-writer on a feature film that was just released by Duplass Brothers Productions um, called I'll Show You Mine, which I was lucky <laughs> Such to a good title. <laughs> title. I know. And I was lucky to co-write that with um, David Shields and Tiffany Lequet, two other writers. So that was a whole process where I learned a lot, I feel, about writing a script that was not based on fiction. And as you pointed out, you know, adapting fiction to script is a whole challenge in itself, but it also is a big head start, I feel like, to writers out there. And I often tell my students this and fiction writers, and I was just telling you this, Caroline, that your work is so cinematic and you've got a huge head start because you've already developed characters. You have a plot you've thought out. You've done like that heavy lifting and, you know, I will say what I was just saying to you, Caroline, that a first step, maybe, if you're sitting out there with a novel manuscript or even a published novel, is go through it with a Sharpie and underline the dialogue and the action. And it's a great idea. You know, it starts to take shape. That's one first step. And then another thing that, um, again, I tell my students at Stone Coast MFA is um, think about previews like everyone loves movie previews and like caroline if your novel you know was a preview what would be the things and you had unlimited resources you know to make the best possible preview 
what would you put in it? And I think that will start your mind going, what are the visuals? What are the most dramatic moments, the funniest lines, all that sort of thing. Um, you know, you you start thinking in those terms. And as you were saying, you know, we, we had quite a little chat before, but you said you <laughs> think about silent movies. Like if you're trying to get in script mode, you know, think about it. The, the short film that we have based on the characters in A Four-Sided Bed, it is kind of impressionistic. It's just sort of shows A Four-Sided Bed is a menage a trois love story. And it's really a love story that's really this, this threesome that loved each other and had this kind of affair like no other and then the repercussions of that later um but in the short film there isn't that much dialogue a lot of it is visuals you know from the store and that's just an 11 minute short film but it is it's really helpful if you start boiling it down to the most dramatic moments most visual and the thing that i try to keep the same carolina is the characters and the spirit of the whole thing. We've changed a lot of different things in A Four-Sided Bed in making it into a feature script. And we now do have um, Creatrix films you mentioned and also our producer, David Ball, out in California. We even have some casting attached, a wonderful actress, Rain Valdez, who helped develop her character in the script. And so someone said a script is a basis for a collaboration. And that's a hard thing for fiction writers, you know, to kind of accept. But I think once you do accept it, you have all, all these helpers. You know, I you're was not the, alone. That's actually my next question, how it differs. Because for many, many years, I wrote my novels alone. And then all of a sudden they became, I got really good editors. And it became a collaboration. Right. And you start to realize it is a collaboration and you're working with somebody who's as invested as you are and it becomes great. And certainly there's some things you don't agree with, but usually with, usually with novels, you can own what you want. I mean, I've never heard of an editor saying, if you don't change this the way I want, I'm not going to publish it. But with films, it feels like there's so much more at stake that sometimes you do have to, given more. Is that true or am I just From what I'm saying, Caroline, that is very true. And the whole thing is, it's just like with, you know, getting married or jumping into a relationship with someone, you really want to be on the same page, just in spirit, in the spirit of the project. You know, with I'll Show You Mine, definitely a lot of changes happened. You know, we turned in what <laughs> the shooting script and then the actors both incredible actors in that film, Porna Jagannathan, who's on Never Have I Ever, and Casey Thomas Brown, who's been in Father the Bride. They, they were both these brilliant actors. And we knew that there would be improv and things added right. and the director. And luckily, you know, I mean, honestly, I was very nervous to see the first version of it that we got to see. And there were a lot of changes, but I truly loved the changes. And I felt like we were so lucky. We had a director, a woman director, Megan Griffiths, and we were all kind of on the same page in terms of the spirit of the project. Now I have had an aborted experience where I wasn't on the same page with some writers. And my advice is, as soon as you discover that, you know, you need to get out, you know, because you're going to have to live with it. It is, it is right. like a relationship. Yeah, it's, it is yeah. a relationship. Yeah, it, it's a very different thing. So I want to talk about another piece of work of yours. Um, I, again, I want to talk about, I'll show you mine. Though not based on fiction, the film does involve some themes from your work that you've used before, such as fluid sexual identities and wireism. How did that film come about and how did your fiction play a role in your role as film co-writer? Well, it did play a role because I was brought into that project by the wonderful writer David Shields, who you may know as about 20 books. He's written both fiction and nonfiction. And he and I had corresponded for years over various things. I'm quoted in some of his books. And he was working on a script and he had read my script, one of my earlier scripts for A Four-Sided Bed. And he said he liked that the lines were freighted with the emotion. <laughs> you know, I'm a very emotion writer. And wow. <laughs> yeah, freighted. And that, I think, was something he and Tiffany Lequette were looking for at that stage of the script. And I, they 
sent me a script that was like 200 pages long, which is very long. You know? That's like, fair. It isn't, isn't it like, long. yeah, it was just isn't it like 120, 120 pages for script? Yes, though? yes 120 yeah, or okay. less. Final script <laughs> something like 105. So obviously a lot of happened. And the script that they sent me was really a lot of just raw material because the premise of the film, I'll show you mine, is these two characters who are telling each other their secret is secrets, Caroline. And so it's sort of a long, intense conversation. We also have, we, we do flashbacks that are done with animation because one of the characters is a cartoonist. We have what we call porn cartoons. They aren't like porn, porn, you know, but they are, they're erotic cartoons that also, you know, break up the conversation because this was shot during COVID. Um, safely with these two actors and what we opened it out in different ways. And so, yeah, it was lucky, but it was also, my husband has an expression, chance favors the prepared mind. <laughs> and, you know, oh, lucky okay. and, you know, it was lucky, but it was also that David and I, David Shields and I did have a connection, a writerly connection. And David was out in Seattle um, where he lives connecting with the local film community there. And that's another piece of advice I want to give to writers. Right, right. Is um, when I first wanted to try doing films, Caroline, I went to Women in Film and Video. Women in Film and Video is like a nationwide organization. I know them. Yeah, they were based you know, in New York, York, I believe. That's right. In New York, a lot of places, major cities, you could find one near you. I went to one of their events and I asked, I just raised my hand and said, I'm a fiction writer. I'd love to do film. What do I do? And they said, start small, start local. And that oh. really... You know, that is what I did on my end of the country and how some of my other projects came to be as I started going to film festivals. And out in Seattle, I would say that David Shields was doing that himself. He was introducing himself, getting involved in the local film community. And that is how he came to know the director, Megan Griffiths. And, you know, she knew people at the Duplass Brothers Productions, which is a great independent film um, company. And so the, that's how those things came about. But they came about because people were out meeting other people and trying to find kindred spirits, I think, is what you try to do. What do you think of things like, I know Women in Film has a, um, they have a, 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 a film contest where you can go upstate and um, learn about film with mentors. And Sundance, of course, has the screenwriting lab. Um, do those help people get a jump start? Or it seems to me that a lot of the Sundance ones seem to be more for people who already have film critics, whereas the one for women in film is like for anybody, anybody. But there's a lot of them that seem that you can never tell. Is it? I, I think there's one like screen pipeline. How do you tell if something is reputable or not reputable or that's does it matter yeah you know that's such a good question and i wish i had had a way of telling when i was especially first just plunging out there you know i followed women film and videos advice and went to the local film festivals now i'm really lucky to live in the boston area so we have the nantucket right. film festival provincetown film festival you know and those were great but you, in a sense, you can't go wrong with a film festival because even if you go to some that are smaller, um, you're going to meet fellow people who are involved in films. You're right. going to get some short films. I do think with conferences where you're paying money and, you know, I would say, you know, go online and, and try to see if there are, you know, comments or complaints or <laughs> Right. You make a mistake. In, in a sense, I made a mistake it was just not the right place for me to go because it was for people further along. But I went to the American film market out in, oh, great. you know, which is really for projects that are further along. So it wasn't the greatest match, but it was at the American film market heading out into one of their social gatherings. I just went over to the person who looked the most nice, you know, and that's <laughs> Um, David Paul, who, we, you know, I was already working with Amy Carpenter Scott, who's an, a woman who oh, runs Facebook great. Film. And I, I met David out at the American Film Market just by chance, and we connected. And he's been this huge part of the Foresighted Bed and, and came to our staged reading that we did in Los Angeles and, you know, just has, has been a huge help. So, but I wouldn't say, I would never advise a beginning scriptwriter to go to American Film Market because it's really for people who <laughs> kind of already have a film, but, and yet it worked out. So you never can tell. One thing that I 
I've noticed in talking to you is that you're extraordinarily brave. Like it feels like nothing was going to stop you, that you just felt I can do this and you went ahead and you did it. Is that correct or are you hiding great shyness? Well, I am hiding great shyness. I, I would never say brave. I, I'm so anxious about everything. But I do, I'm um, bloody minded is a word that I saw somebody use for writers. I do get determined. I'm a determined Okay, individual. that's good. Yeah, yeah. And and I I worry all the time. I over worry things, but I do have this determination and I have always loved film and I always wanted it to have yeah. my work on screen somehow. So that was a big goal of mine. My mother adored film and she was someone who held parties for Oscar night, you know. <gasps> oh, that's so wonderful. <laughs> so she always said we came by it naturally, you know. Um, my sister and I and my brother and we we have always you know, loved movies. Yeah, that's that's like, that's the one thing. Like my, my son is now an adult. And the one thing when I see him that I feel like I did my job right, is he's a movie-holic. He's always going to movies. So I feel like, okay, that's really good. I want to talk about two of my favorite personalities, Tanya Harding and Nancy Karadick. And, and your fiction to stage when you took your novella, Celebrities in Disguise, and used it as the inspiration for Tanya and Nancy, the rock opera, which has been produced in Boston, LA, Chicago, and New York City. Um, you know, what drew you to write about that particular scandal, uh, both in a book and on the stage, and why not a film? Well, why not film? I mean, we would certainly be open to film. There is a concert film of it that's available online uh, uh, under streamingmusicals.com that was filmed in New York. One of our, we had a concert version at 54 Below, the great nightclub in New York with an all Broadway cast. So there is that. We'd love to do it on film. <laughs> but um, what has first started that, you know, Caroline, like many, many people, I was obsessed with that story. And oh, yeah. you know, my- Me too friend, the great writer, Suzanne Strempik Shea says, write what you can't shut up about. And, you know, <gasps> that's a great line. That is a great line. Okay. Yeah. And it's so true. And I was obsessed with that. And I, I sometimes tell my students, if you're obsessed with some weird thing, you know, go for it, you know, find some right. way to do it. And so celebrities in disgrace was <laughs> a strange, um, you know, story in itself where Tanya and Nancy are in the background, but it's actually focused on this young actress who's going to try to audition to be to play Nancy Kerrigan in the film and she winds up acting out you know the knee whack in a drunken incident with cameras involved so <laughs> so that was a whole different thing and then I have a very talented niece Abigail Dory Cross who's a composer and she was studying composition at Tufts and she had a chance to do a a final project which she wanted to be a one-act opera and she asked me if I would write a libretto and my first thought, because I was still obsessed with Tanya Nancy, was, oh, my gosh, it should be an opera. It's got, like, these big emotions, you know, you've got it jealousy. Sure does. Yeah. So that was my first foray into script writing after many years of writing fiction. And it happened to coincide. I had a kid. I have a kid. You know, but as a mom, I was finding, you know, Virginia Woolf says you need an uninterrupted trance to write a novel. I did not have an uninterrupted trance. You I know, don't know about that. <laughs> I don't know that much. Yeah, you don't have an uninterrupted trance. But what I found was writing an opera or rock opera, you could do it in these little bursts. You could like literally think about, I sometimes think about the movie Coal Miner's Daughter and Loretta. Oh, yeah. and she's you know working in the garden and the kids are running around and she's writing a song and I would get these pieces of music when we started doing Tanya and Nancy as a rock opera with a friend of my niece's um, Michael Tioli who's a great composer out in Los Angeles and we were all across the country but he'd send me little bits of music I'd write down you know the beats of them and just think about it all day what the lyrics would be and you can imagine that was just kind of better suited to life running around with a kid right so, you know, I, to me, it was a lifeline to be able to do scripts. And that was the start into it. Would you like to do something else for the stage? I mean, if you had to say, like, which ones you like, you enjoy the most, is it like novel script stage or scripts novel stage? I don't think stage is first for some reason. Well, oh, here, Renee asked a question just that. What do you enjoy writing more? Sorry, Renee. I stole your question. Oh, great. Hi, Renee. <laughs> Um, you know, 
that it's all writing to me. I am a happy writer. There are a lot of things about the writing life I don't like. I don't like you know, all the things nobody likes, you know, the you know, the professional part where you have to run around finding, you know, your publishers and stuff. But I love right. to write. I just love to write. And mm -hmm. honestly, right now, I am more into film because I'm kind of totally psyched about I'll Show You Mine. It was such an incredible thing. And <laughs> as we all know, Caroline, you know, a lot of people have interest in their work or their various things, you know, seem to be about to happen. Seldom, seldom does it actually happen. And we, as the writers of I'll Show You Mine, we're just like holding our breaths, you know, thinking, is this actually happening? But it did. <gasps> and they did a beautiful job. And it's very exciting to me. It, it's exhilarating to have that film. I'm proud of it. So now I'm very much into right now. Actually, I would say what I'm into now, Caroline, is the subject that you came up with for this book to film. I have a lot of material in my books, not only my novels. Oh, yeah. But, yeah, that I really would love to change. You change them, you change them up, but write as scripts, and that is what I'm doing. So, you know, you you wrote a feminist thriller, Lock Her Up, simultaneously as a novel and a script. Are you insane? How did you do that? That's the first part. The screenplay has won several awards. How did that process work? And do you recommend that students do this or not do this? And wait, there's one more part. Aren't there any books out that are good for novelists in terms of adapting their books to film? That is a good question, Caroline. Not that, I mean, I'm sure there are. I can't think of any that I read. That's why probably I'm making up my own zany rule book here. And I certainly <laughs> would say it might not work for everyone. You you know, Caroline, I'm a kind of hyper person. <laughs> and you know, I feel like so for me, somehow or other, and I did um I do tell my students this this was fun for me. I had this idea for a thriller, lock her up, basically a kind of a woman being uh framed for murder by her crazed right wing in-laws. <laughs> And, you know, very much <laughs> tapping into the zeitgeist. I try to have on both sides of the divide some rounded characters. It's really a tale of two sister-in-laws. And um, like one of my sister-in-laws is watching. It's not about you. <laughs> <laughs> it probably is a little bit, though, right? <laughs> wonderful sisters-in-law, but this would be, you know, this mismatch and, and then they wind up, you know, changing. But anyway, I had this idea and I tried working on it as a novel and it just didn't work for me or I couldn't get it going. And then I thought, well, I'll just try it as a script. And it just took off as a script, in my opinion. You know, I, I was just galloping along with it, but I still wanted to write the novel. And what I did, Caroline, is I was kind of pleased with the script. And as a writer, as a fiction writer, I often write, you know, kind of dense, in a sense, literary fiction where you go deep inside the character and so on. And I was trying for this project to break myself of that, to be more cinematic. So I took the darn script, which was in final draft script software. I plopped it into a Word doc and I found this great button that said text only. And I pressed text only and all the formatting disappeared. And suddenly it was dialogue action, you know, and oh, I used that. A great job. Yeah, that was kind of a discovery. I thought. Great idea. That's really yeah. a good idea. So and that then really I went helped back you. And forth. And the back and forth part, Caroline, was what really helped as a writer. And that I would say to fellow writers out there is I would write some of it in novel form and learn more about the characters. Then I'd go back into script form and I would wind up upping the plot and then go back to the novel, you know, like, so you went back and forth. And so to me, it was fun. To some people, it would totally drive you crazy. You know, you have to kind of find your own ways, but um, I enjoyed it. You know, one fun fact about you is that you used to write <laughs> soap opera scripts as a child. <laughs> so I want to hear about that because that's, that's so incredible. Usually as kids, like you might write little stories, but the idea of a child writing soap opera is hilarious. So how did you come about doing that? What was your soap opera called? And do you still have copies of that? Wow, well, I'm happy to say what it's called. I, I think someone who's on here is my brother, Bill. And my sister and I had written this as a radio, <laughs> quote unquote, radio soap opera script. We were out in the countryside of South Carolina and we had what were called walkie talkies, which more mature viewers today would know are these. <laughs> <laughs> I know walkie talkies, right? Yeah, they were ridiculous. But we had this notion that we could broadcast 
the soap opera on a walkie talkie mm -hmm. and maybe someone out there would hear it. And my wow. mother, all her life, uh, you know, well, not all her life, but from that, you know, for many years, watched The Young and the Restless, a great um, TV soap opera. And in fact, I have to put in a plug, I co-edited with um, the aforementioned friend, Suzanne Strempik Shea, we co-edited a book called Soap Opera Confidential, you know, why we tune in tomorrow as the world turns restlessly by the guiding light of our lives. <laughs> so that was that. But the title of the soap opera, my brother heard the first script and he commented, what a way to live. <laughs> and we called it What a Way to Live, which I think could be the title. That's of a great it. title. Yeah, they, yeah. they used to have this program, I think it was through, I don't know what network it was, where for six weeks you could go to soap opera writing school. You couldn't do anything else except go to school for that. And then they would get you a job. And I so wanted to do it, but I couldn't afford to because I had to work but i remember in what one thing about the soap barbers is they do you do learn i believe what hooks people and they always have a hook on the end so you cannot wait to see you know if teddy is really the father of juno's baby or whatever um, i love that story that's completely completely wonderful so i also wanted to ask you you know in in books the in with writers of novels there's always always conversations about how to get an agent who's your agent blah, 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 because you need an agent when you're a novel when you're a novelist there are some people who can do books without an agent but they either self-publish or it's a fluke is it that way with film i mean do you need an agent or and what's the difference between an agent and a manager these are good questions that I'm figuring out as I go along. In fact, I, again, lean on women in film and video. I've gone to, you know, events discussing that very subject. And as I understand it, not an expert yet, but um, a manager is more what you would seek as a beginner because a manager is someone oh. who will take you, hopefully, under their wing and kind of help you develop your career. Whereas okay. an agent, as I understand it, is more for the later stages when you are, you know, more established. And some people have both. I think people who are quite successful have both a manager and agent. I'm working on getting a manager. That's one of my um, big goals right how, now. How do you do that? I mean, with, well, with novelists, there's a, you go to their website, they tell you what they want and you do it. And then you yeah. wait for either the rejections or the acceptances. How does that work with film? Well, you know, again, I'm learning as I go along. There are two organizations, Roadmaps and Stage 32, that both offer online classes. You have opportunities to pitch to um, people, to agents, to people in the industry. And every once in a while, if you do a number of those, you start getting some connections. My path was atypical in a way because I did, I do now have a feature film credit, you know, as a co-writer on I'll Show You Mine. And I, That's there great. were no you know, on my end, no agents involved in that. It was, and you know, that's part of the beauty of the indie film world is there are people out there and we were very lucky to have a really great production company, Duplass Brothers Production Company and the, and the um, Nell Elson, the female, you know, CEO of them. Um, but there are smaller ones. And of course there are instances where writers and directors get together and, you know, scrap together an independent film on their own. You have, you know, things like the Blair Witch Project or, you know, some things that right, we need on right. the stream, you know, that become a phenom. And there's also something, again, I'd say to the writers out there, short films are a very doable form. And, you know, I had the short film that was made from Celebrities in Disgrace and the short film now, Four Sided. We made Four Sided in a way as a calling card for the larger project. And in fact, it got, it's, it um, premiered, believe it or not, in Cannes, France, not as, you know, official wow. Cannes film festival, but there was a side kind of screenings for short films that had the potential to be features. And so that was a great category for us. And that's how we premiered it. And your short film is your calling card. You, it gets you, you know, into film festivals. And probably that's one of the, better ways in a sense is if you can get involved in a short film, then you have a, a, a sort of reason to go to these festivals and, and you get to go free and all that kind of stuff. And um, that's how you start meeting people. And I, you know, at Nantucket Film Festival, when I went there 
you know, ages ago, I met someone who turned out to be very important to my theater career, Paul Bokosian, a producer who produced Tanya Nancy and is still the producer of Tanya Nancy for many years. I met him at a party thrown by Imagine Magazine, another great resource wow. here in Nigeria yeah. that holds these events and therefore the film community. So I look for these groups, you know, I used to be part of Penn New England. Now there isn't a Penn New England, sadly, but I think these organizations that try to bring together the community are a great thing to join. Always. It's the same way with writing novels. We have another question. Thank you, John H. Have you ever started writing a novel, gotten bogged down and decided it really wanted to be a film? It's a good question. Yeah, you know, I would kind of say that's what happened with Lock Her Up is I did start it as a novel. I did get bogged down and I did think maybe it would be better as a film. And in that case, I feel like it is. I'm trying to make it equally good, hopefully on both ends. But right now I feel like the film script is more finished and maybe it will just be a film script. But I'm hoping actually, you know, it can be both. But it certainly was a great process for me. And that is what happened. Yeah, bogged down is a good word. And that's the thing, Caroline, is once I started writing scripts, I felt like weights had been cut off of my arms and legs. Like I, I have, had always been this fiction writer and I love the process, but I'm a very <laughs> slow fiction writer. I, I get really deep into the character. It takes me forever to you know write the prose. Whereas in scripts, you're suddenly just like, it's dialogue, it's action, it just clips along. You know, it's not easier per se, because you go over and over it, you know, you wind up doing as much work as with anything, but it is fast and I'm fast. I think fast, you know, I just, I'm a kinetic person. So in that sense, I felt like it really suited me. In terms of time, would you say, say a novel takes you three or four years and a script takes you six weeks? I mean, what, what is that process like? You know, that's a good, um, I would have to say a, a plus for scripts is you can easily, yes. easily spend years on a novel. Now, over a period of a long time, like I've been developing the script of A Four-Sided Bed over a period of many years, um, but you're not sitting there continuously writing this thing. I think with scripts, it's more like you have a bout with it, then you send it out and get responses. So it is shorter. It is a shorter um, kind of investment of time and energy, mostly, I would say. I, there might be exceptions, but um, you know, these novels, I mean, how long does the average novel, you, you are fast, you're prolific. But, um, fast, it takes me four years. It's usually four like, years. I yeah. write the whole thing and then, then it's usually when I announce it, it seems like much less time, but it takes me forever. It's really, really long time. But I, I also wanted to ask you like, in the scheme of stuff for, for people out there who are novelists, which is more important to have? Well, I guess the script is the most important thing to have first, but is it more important to have an actor attached or a director or a producer? Can you ever just hand your book to an actress and say, oh, I see you as Melinda in this story, or are they not allowed to do that because it has to go through their agent and their manager? Yeah, it's complicated. I, I would say that if you had some opportunity to hand your script to an actor or actress who you felt could really, you know, catch people's attention, um, that would be a good thing to do. I think it's important to find a producer because that's sort of their job is to figure out- Oh, it's their job, how do we, okay. How do we add, who do we add? We have, as I said, a, m a number of great attachments to a four-sided bed, including, a, you know, a casting person, you know, the, the and I wouldn't even have known where to begin with some of that, right. um, but you know, a producer who did. But, you know, there are people who do indie films themselves who start, probably with the script and gathering together an actor, you know, I think it's great if you can start putting together a team because obviously it's a team. Right. Right. You need that. Nobody the film alone. Yeah. Let's go back to your work. We got him. <laughs> That's like it's another great, you're so good with titles. Oh, okay. We you. got him. I love the book. It's now becoming its way into a script. It's about a pregnant stepmother and a troubled stepson set against the Boston Marathon bombing in 2013. So I want to talk about the difference between the book and the script and what was left behind when you were writing the script, do you think, in order to make it a really great script? And Well, so far, that one... 
Yeah, that one's at a very early stage with being a script. It is a more challenging one to me to adapt because it's very inner. As you know, a lot of it's about yeah, the it is inner. Yeah, yeah. And so in the novel, and really I wrote the first draft of that novel before the marathon bombings had occurred. And it was all about, you know, it really came about, Caroline, because this great writer, really? Alex Johnson, gave me a journal from Italy, a blank journal at my baby shower. You know, everything else was for the baby. But she gave me this to write down my impressions of the birth, which was so sweet of her. That's and a it was great idea. But I took it right in, you know, and I did do that. And I had I had wanted to write, I wanted to write about a birth. But the thing was, that novel in that form didn't have a big enough engine. You know, it's like a jet plane. You've got to have a plot engine to make the thing take right, off. Right. I knew that, but it just it ultimately didn't have enough. And then when the bombings happened, I already had a character oh. in the novel who was the stepson who had dark hair. And it really mm -hmm. struck me. Of course, it was all terrifying. You know, the, the bombings and these pictures were released in the Boston area and everywhere that were blurry pictures of who they felt the suspects were, the, a dark haired young guy. And, uh, That's right. There were a few who weren't actually the suspect, if I'm remembering. Well, you know, I'm sure there were a lot of people pulled in or, or, you know, looked at who weren't the suspect. And that was actually the idea. I thought, well, I have this stepson who's troubled, who kind of does run off on the birth night, who's dark haired. He actually was. And, and you know, I, I just, that, that then I suddenly thought, what if, you know, it takes place on the night of the manhunt. And, um, you know, it all started coming together. Then there was obviously a lot more tension. And I think if in turning it into a script, I would make it more about that subplot, the subplot of the boy and what happens in the manhunt. Whereas in the book, I do stay a lot um, with the, you. you know, the birth. So when you were writing very interior scenes in the book and you're, and you're moving to film, would you like try to take, say, if the subject is deep in thought about like something that shaped him, would you just try to think, well, how am I going to make this work visually without having to, maybe there's a photograph of the boy and his right. father or something like, okay. Okay. I'm or, learning you know, <laughs> a really fun thing. Caroline, that film can do is you can have a memory flash. Like if your character is having a memory, you know, you could just have a flash visually or even a short scene. You know how that often happens in film. Right, right, you know, right. That's just an example. But yeah, you do. You try to think, how can I show this? Is there some way, you know, I can do it with it? And it's hard. And some things you just can't do. You know, there are definitely right. things you wind up leaving on the cutting room floor in either direction for book or, or you know, okay. or for film. We have another question from Renee. Do you run marathons and or participate, play any sports? You know, that is a great question because one of the things I most rely on as a writer is I love to bike. Uh, we live near the Minuteman bike trail and I am oh, not- Oh, trail. Yeah, I am not a marathon biker. I am a slow biker. I'm very slow, but I love biking and it clears my head. And literally any day that I can do it, I'm out there on the trail. I bike about four miles whenever I can. And it is a part of my writing process, Caroline. I'll spend, you know, on an ideal day where I'm not doing other things, teaching or whatnot, I think about my, do my writing and then get out on the bike trail and it just clears your head. And it's a great form of yeah. exercise because no one can bug you, you know, like you're yeah. riding <laughs> Well, they can, they can wave you down. <laughs> you're in your own little world. Well, we need to stop. And before we do, I want to remind everybody, bookshop.org. You can buy all of Elizabeth's book. Um, somebody said, I forget which film of yours is it streamable. Was it, was it? I'll show you oh, mine. I'll show you mine. It's I'll show you mine, which is what I'm going to stream immediately. And I want to thank you all for being here and for all the great questions. And I especially want to thank Elizabeth for being here. And we'll see you all next week. Thank you, Caroline. Bye.